Hi. I've finally emerged from the trenches of building Loopy Masterpieces playback system. And to be honest, <laughs> it's not interesting or glamorous or fun. Uh, I did a video yesterday attempting to explain the process of making it and testing it. And I showed it to my business partner, Sebastian. <laughs> he said it was a chore to watch, which is never a good sign. So this is take two. Loopy Masterpiece differs from Loopy in one major respect, which is that everything is non-destructive. You know, Loopy, when you overdub, it'll record to the same track again. That makes it really simple for working with audio in Loopy because the memory requirements are, are pretty small. You're just keeping one audio track per track. But with Masterpiece, because if you do five overdubs, you get five versions of the track. And because everything is recorded in 32-bit audio, it's floating point 32-bit, which gives you a lot of headroom, but the audio is twice as big. It's not really feasible to do everything in memory anymore. So basically the app would crash if you had you no, know, say you have 16 different tracks with four or five layers each. That's too much to really fit in memory and it'll just not work. So what Masterpiece has to do is record it straight to the disc and stream it from disc when you're playing, which is quite a bit more involved. You see, it's not instantaneous reading from disc. It, it takes some time. So whereas Loopy previously, when you played a track, it could just grab the audio you need to play straight away. No delay at all. Loopy Masterpiece actually needs to kind of predict, needs to read in advance of where you're going to be playing because it can take a few hundred milliseconds to get the audio into memory. So that's what I've been working on, a player that will um, allow you to uh, cue a certain point in the file. You can sort of prime some frames so that you can jump to that spot and immediately be able to play back from there so that you can jump to the start of a track, for instance. And then it will basically stream audio from the disc ahead of the playhead. So, you know, you'll have the playhead moving along and there's a reader that runs at the same time, which is looking ahead and pulls in audio as you play back. So that's, that's a fairly involved process. And uh, this time around, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but it involves a lot of juggling buffers so that you can do things like seek to a different part in the track uh, without being you know, glitchy or without taking too long to give you audio from there. So that was, <laughs> that was quite a lot of work. And then I was able to, once I had that sort of building block, um, the next thing to do was to build up a renderer. I'm, I'm calling it a clip renderer because clips are sort of the, the top level part of audio for a track. You know, a, a, a track can have multiple clips which you can switch between and they're kind of versions of that track. And each of those clips is built up of your overdub layers. So the clip renderer basically takes all of those layers which can be uh, any length, they can wrap, they can be um, truncated versions of an audio file. So you can import uh, any piece of audio and you can drag the beginning and end points and make a loop out of that. And Loopy will automatically apply crossfade over the boundary so that it's a nice smooth transition as you loop. Um, you can put kind of one shot pieces of audio right in the middle of a loop if you want. You know, if you want, if you have a, say a drum loop and you want some kind of a hit in there. You can just import that hit audio and it'll mix it in. It can take different tempos, different sample rates and bring them all in line as part of the rendering process. So you end up with a single piece of audio that's um, taking into account all of those different factors as well as volume and pan per layer. There's quite a lot of kind of detailed messing around with audio, which is, uh, it needs to be perfect. So. I mentioned last time about uh, how I was using test-driven development to check sample by sample that the audio was correct. And I did that this time as well. Last video that I'm not going to show you because I threw it away, I walked you through some of the samples um, to show that they're correct. But coming back to it, they kind of all look, all look and sound the same. So I won't bore you with the details, but the idea is to make sure that it's working perfectly and to avoid running into trouble in the future if I ever change anything. Um, I'm generating a number of tracks and then I take pieces of those tracks, put them together in a clip, play them back 
and then I look at every single sample of that audio to make sure it's exactly as expected. And that involves checking that the crossfades across loop boundaries is right and microfades in and microfades out and um, yeah. And happily, it's done, I'm there. It was an incredibly boring few weeks, but I have survived and happily I'm now at the point where I can put it all together and have some tracks that work. This is where it gets really exciting because I've, I've been waiting to have working infrastructure. And I'm now at the point where all of the main infrastructure, except for the MIDI stuff, is kind of done. Um, I don't really know where that puts me in terms of the overall timeline. It's a bit too soon to tell, but um, I'm at the point where I can now start sticking some user interface stuff together and have some really cool things to show you and play with myself. So that's next. Anyway, that's it for me. Here's your moment of zen. Second moment of first quarter. Immediately after that, the second quarter of track and so on. That's how it is. The third test involves taking the first quarter of two separate layers and looking at the first quarter of the That means it's actually doing a transition across the loop down. So it's basically allowing you to take a full quarter. 